<clears throat> All right, this morning uh, we're continuing in the, um, the book of Acts, seeing examples, um, examples of what is ongoing, how the, uh, the, the church evangelized, I mean, the fact that they, they did evangelize, this is what they were all about, uh, and how they approached different people groups. And as I've already mentioned this morning, we're going to see an example of how they approach people who worship the pantheon of uh, Greek gods, uh, of mytho mythology, um, you know, the ones they make all these movies about, Medusa and all these various other things. But um, there were people who actually believed that, that these things were real. Some of them saw them as perhaps images and parables. I think that may have been true of Socrates and Plato. But um, others really believed in their existence. But they are false gods, they are idols, and again, this is a warning against idolatry, and the gospel calls us to turn away from all idolatry to the true God. But let me go ahead and read the text. We're going to look at verses 8 through 18. Now Luke writes, uh, through the inspiration of the Spirit, at Lystra a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who... When he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lycaonian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowds, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, and yet he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even saying these things, with difficulty they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. But may the Lord bless His Word. May He help us to benefit from it this morning. <clears throat> now, last time we saw the Lord give Paul and Barnabas, as I said before, great power in their preaching uh, to, to the effect that, that many believed in the gospel. Now, I, I just say this again because I want to keep this in, in our minds. We know that in evangelism, the Lord is the one who makes all the difference. That's what we just sang about in How Sweet and Awesome is the Place. You know, God is the one who gives the gift of the new birth and of the Holy Spirit that makes us alive. He's the one who awakens us to our need through the law, usually, through fear. And He is the one who, when He chooses and to whom He chooses, gives spiritual life. It's all in His hands. But we also saw that the one bringing the message is also a part of the equation. He is the one who gives power to the one who is evangelizing in order to arrest and focus the attention of the hearer so that they will pay attention to the message. Now, when we speak with others, we really need to pray for both of these things. Again, if we, if we come to somebody sheepishly and apologetically in the sense of you know, apologizing for the fact that we're telling them things maybe they don't want to hear, and, you know, we, we really don't have a strong conviction of its truth. We're going to convince them not to believe rather than to believe. Although we would admit God uses all different ways to bring people to himself. I remember one person told me he had a Bible that he gave to somebody, and that person read that Bible, and, and they were saved. So all he did was hand him the Bible. God can work in a variety of ways, but we know that one of the main ways in which he works, as we know from the examples of John Wesley and George Whitfield is that he works through a very powerful testimony and witness as it comes from the one who is sharing. And how do we get that power? It comes through the Holy Spirit. It comes from giving ourselves fully to him. 
Now, we also saw the pushback that this brought from the Jews, that they not only pushed back themselves, but they tried to turn all the Gentiles, all the God-fearers against the disciples or against the apostles as well. And this reminded us that when God's kingdom intrudes into the world, the world is always going to push back. The enemy is going to push back. Those who are in darkness hate the light. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And they will not come to the light because it exposes their sins. It makes them feel guilty. And the reason why they're trying to, you know, take refuge in the darkness is so they, they don't have to face the light. So they hate it. But they not only hate it themselves, they're going to do everything they can to turn other people against the light because they feel their strength in numbers. The more people who agree with them, the more comfortable they're going to feel about their sins. We saw Paul and Barnabas persist in spite of the opposition. They continued there for a long time because the Lord was continuing to work through them, proving His Word through miracles. People were coming to Christ. People were being built up in Him. You're not going to leave while there's fruitfulness. You know, we should never give up just because people oppose us uh, or begin to maybe say nasty things about us or spread rumors. We just need to keep on sharing the truth, knowing that the Lord is going to do His work through us. And we need to keep on, as it were, until we no longer see any fruit. If we don't see any fruit, then that's the time to, to move on. We saw that this interaction between the apostles and uh, the Jews and the Gentiles ended with the whole city becoming divided, separated into two camps, some siding with the Jews that were opposed to the, the apostles and others with the apostles. And again, we understand that the gospel not only saves, the gospel also divides, doesn't it? Jesus said that it would separate even the most intimate relationships, husbands and wives, I mean, Paul gives instructions in 1 Corinthians 7, what to do in the case of an unbelieving a spouse that departs. Parents and children, I think we all know something about that. And then, you know, brothers and sisters, intimate relationships. But we shouldn't let that from, you know, stop us from sharing it either because it's the only way they can be saved. We have to tell them the truth. And if they hate it and they want to retaliate against it, there's nothing we can do about it. We still need to share the truth with them. So don't be afraid of sharing the truth just because you think it's going to divide. Jesus said it would. Now, this division eventually brought persecution. You know, when the world can't argue against the light, it will try to put the light out. Jesus said that if we follow Him, if we become like Him, if we share His Word with other people, if we shine His light, the world is going to hate us. The world is going to persecute us. That's inevitable. You know, Jesus said something else, again, that to his disciples, which isn't something we often hear, but we need to take into account when he says, you know, don't be, don't be afraid of the world. Uh, just count on the fact that it's going to persecute you. We should be more concerned if nobody persecutes us. Jesus said in Luke 6, verse 26, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. If the way you're living, the things you're saying are not rubbing people the wrong way, then there's not enough light that's really coming from you to do that. You know, if, if, we, if we get rankled by what we're hearing this morning, that's because the light is hitting us, and it's going to hit all of us in various ways. Our response should be, you know, yes, the Word of God is right. And I need to take that into account. I need to change to become more like Jesus. Now, finally, we saw the apostles' perseverance that they didn't give up just because, you know, there was rejection in these cities, but they went to other cities and continued to preach the gospel. Perseverance is the key to fruitfulness in God's kingdom. Jesus told his disciples when he sent them out to preach, if one town rejects you or if an individual refuses to listen to you, then you need to move on because there are others who will listen. Now, this morning, we see that Paul and Barnabas have moved on. We read about that in, I think it was verses 6 and 7. And now we see them in Lystra. Since the Jews rejected the gospel, they turn now to the Gentiles. And again, that's their way of operation. Remember, to the Jew first. Then when the Jew rejects, they go to the Gentiles. 
And here we get a glimpse into how they evangelized them. We actually get a little bit of the content this time of what they were saying. And we see that they were, they were appealing uh, to prove that God exists. They appeal to natural revelation, not to, his, not to the Scriptures so much, even though the Scripture tells us about natural revelation, but to that revelation itself, to the God who created all that we see. Now, we read in verses 8 through 10 that when they arrived in Lystra, they immediately went to work. While they were preaching, there was a man who was listening to them who had never walked. Now, Luke draws our attention to this man. I think it's because having been in this condition since he was born, we know from the Jewish culture as well, his livelihood must have been begging alms for a living. And he had been doing this for some time because he was lame from birth. He had never walked. Most people then would know him, and they would know about his situation. So here we have a likely candidate to receive a miracle, at least from the Lord's perspective, because he had high visibility. People would notice a change in this man, you know, who had been sitting there for so many years. When the Lord did miracles, He typically did not do them in a corner just to benefit one individual, but He did them publicly so that everyone would see them, so that they would pay attention to what was being said, so that they might believe. Now, Paul noticed this man listening, and he noticed that he had faith to be healed. Okay, it's probably not some halo over his head or some sort of a, you know, a tongue of fire or some other kind of visible manifestation, he probably saw in the man's face a certain sense of hopefulness and expectancy, perhaps in his eyes, perhaps in his countenance. But seeing that this man had this expectancy and hopefulness, he called out to him in a loud voice so that everybody would know that what was about to happen to him was connected with their message. He said, stand upright on your feet. He issued a command with the kind of faith that we see in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, when Jesus issued a command like that, He expected that command to be obeyed. He expected that God would give the ability and the power to obey it. And the man obeyed. He believed. He believed the Lord uh, would give him the strength to do this, and he leaped up and began to walk. By the way, there's an important lesson in how this man received this miracle because it's essentially the way we receive anything from the Lord. The Lord is not going to give us what, what we need by way of strength to do what He commands unless we begin to do what He commands. I, I hope you can see the distinction there. Sometimes we just sit and we pray and we wait for the Lord to give us that strength and that courage and that power to act when the Lord wants us to act first, and then He will give us that strength. That's what we need to do. Step out first. Trust that the Lord is going to help us before, he's go before He actually does help us. This is how He teaches us to trust in Him. I mean, it doesn't take any trust to minister in strength and courage. It takes trust to minister in fear. I mean, courage, it's been said nobody really has courage unless they have fear. You know, courage is basically surmounting the fear, overcoming that fear, and doing what it is we need to do. You need courage to do that. You don't need courage to do, some, to do something you're not afraid of, in other words. But we need to trust the Lord that He's going to give us that strength and step out and do what He calls us to do, and then we will experience it. That is, in fact, how it works, uh, so we need to take that into account. Now, I want us to notice a couple of things here uh, from this interaction first. That whether the audience was Jewish or Greek, the Lord was empowering His messengers to perform miracles to confirm that their message was from Him. I think that's a very important element of, um, of apologetics, okay, miracle. This is how God shows who His messengers actually are. This was not something only for the Jews, it was for every audience. And I want us to notice, secondly, that from an apologetic perspective, there's a huge difference between seeing a miracle and reading about the miracle in the Bible. I think anybody who saw this miracle would be hard-pressed to deny 
that God exists. They saw it with their own eyes. A man who had been lame from birth suddenly leaping up and running around. It was very, very convincing. And that's the reason why the Lord gave His apostles the power to do them. Now, more is needed than just a miracle. They also need to listen to the gospel. The Spirit of God needs to work to give them the faith to believe. But this is how they get attention. But, on the other hand, many people can read the Bible where these miracles are recorded and still deny that God exists. Okay? You see it, it's immediately obvious. If you read about it, it's not quite so obvious. As a matter of fact, R.C. has told us that many reject the Bible because it records miracles. Remember, if you have a presupposition that God doesn't exist, then how are you going to accept the fact that here's a book that records miracles that only God could do? They're going to think it's merely a myth. And that's why we need to make sure that we start with God's existence before we try to prove that the Bible is His Word. If God exists... Miracles are possible. They're not only possible, they actually did take place. We have many eyewitness accounts to the fact that they did in the Bible. But now there's an interesting twist in this particular interaction here because uh, everyone in this audience already believed in the existence of God, at least some kind of God, right? Right? This miracle, the fact that this miracle took place, it might have surprised them, as it usually does. It's, it's a, you know, the, the word for miracle in, in the original language is basically something that, it, it's, a, it's a mighty act that terrifies, that, that amazes. People can't believe their eyes. It stops traffic. It's not this, you know, warm feeling in my shoulder and now the pain is gone. But it would be like somebody without an arm just growing an arm or something like that, or legs growing legs, or somebody who's dead being raised to life. I mean, that stops traffic, right? So it might have surprised them that this miracle took place because I'm sure they didn't see any miracles, but they believe, even though they believed they could take place. But, well, it would say they're not surprised that it could take place. They were surprised that it did take place, okay? Because their worldview included many gods, okay? So they believed in the possibility. They were surprised by the fact that it took place. Now, that brings us to our second point, and it's an evangelistic and apologetic point. The miracle they did, which was meant to prove the existence of the true God, was misunderstood. They thought Paul and Barnabas had actually done this miracle, and because they had, that they were the gods, okay? Luke writes in verses 11 through 12, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lycaonian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Now, I'm sure most of us have, have either read some mythology or seen some you know, movie based on mythology. We know that Zeus, according to Greek mythology, was the king of the, of the gods. He, he was the, um, the one who was in charge, you know, the capricious... Um, uh, you know, basically sex-driven character. I mean, the guy is totally immoral. And he's, he stands ready with his lightning bolt to, sh you know, shoot down anyone that, that opposes him. But Hermes was his messenger. He was the one he would send to, um, to convey a message, maybe to an oracle or, or to somebody else in, in this world. Now, since Paul was doing all the talking, um, which may be an indication of how Paul and Barnabas actually operated, you know, maybe Paul was the chief spokesman, as it were. He was the one who was more gifted. He was the one who evangelized. Um, since he was doing all the talking, they thought Barnabas must be the one in charge and that Paul was basically Hermes because he's doing all the speaking. Now, the people were so convinced by the power of this miracle that they thought the only thing they could do was to honor the gods. And so they, they brought uh, a priest who brought animals in order to sacrifice to them. Now, the point is this, that the miracle wasn't enough, was it? They interpreted this miracle in terms of their own culture, in terms of their own worldview. And so now what they were about to do was to dishonor the true God. 
So it reminds us, first of all, that it's not enough that somebody believes in a God because a God cannot save us. R.C. in our series on defending the faith reminded us that about 95% of mankind believes in the existence of some kind of God. But some kind of God can't save us. Only the true God can save us. And they need to believe in that true God and honor and serve Him. We need not only to argue for the existence of a God, we need to argue for the existence of the true God. And that's what we see Paul and Barnabas do next. So finally, having established that God exists through this miracle, they now set out to correct this misunderstanding as to who this God really is. Now, the apostles knew that what the people were about to do for them was blasphemous. Remember how um, on one occasion um, John got down at, basically on his, on his face before the angel and wanted to worship him, and the angel said, get up. I'm just a fellow servant of God like you are. Worship God. Don't worship me. But, of course, whenever Jesus was worshipped in that way, he always received it because, of course, he is God. But only God is to be worshipped, and the apostles knew that very well. Moses writes in Deuteronomy 6, verses 13 through 15, You shall fear only the Lord your God. And by the way, that's not just any God. That is Yahweh. And you shall worship Him and swear by His name. Notice you are not only to do this for Him alone, but you are to do this for Him. Okay? You are to worship Him. You shall not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who surround you. For the Lord your God in the midst of you is a jealous God. Otherwise, the anger of the Lord your God will be kindled against you. And he will wipe you off the face of the earth. Why, why did the children of Israel in the land face so many foreign armies? Why, why did they finally get taken out of the land? It was for idolatry spiritual adultery. God was a jealous God. His anger was kindled, and He wiped them off the face of the land. He took them out of the land. Many of them died. Many of them He, he spared. But the fact is, only God is to be worshipped. And Paul and Barnabas knew that very well. So when they realized what the people were doing, they tore their robes, again, to show their abhorrence of what was going on. They ran out into the crowd in order to stop them. Now, again, their desire was to honor the Lord and Him first of all. And that, that honors God when He sees that we want to honor Him and not ourselves. The first thing they did was they pointed to the fact that we're just as human as, as you are. Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you. We're not gods. We're just men. You know, it, it doesn't matter how you know, talented we might be, it doesn't matter how wealthy, it doesn't matter how handsome or how beautiful, we are all just human beings. We are no better than anyone else, and we are infinitely below God. And think about how people are idolized today. Someday it's going to come back to get them. Now, secondly, he, they said not only that, but we have come in order to turn you away from the very thing you're attempting to do right now, to turn you away from these vain idols and to embrace the true God. They said, we preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now, they are quoting here a portion of Scripture or perhaps truths that are in the Scripture, but notice the type of truth that they are quoting or, or appealing to. General revelation. They're appealing to the fact that there is a Creator and to His creative power and His wisdom. That is one of the ways by which we know that God exists. Now, with the Jews, they could quote any part of Scripture to prove their point. And they would do that often. They, they didn't have to appeal to general revelation because they knew the true God. They had to appeal to the specific truths about Christ and what He came to do and who He was. But with the Gentiles, who did not respect the authority of Scripture, they had to appeal to the things in nature to support the fact that the Bible is, in fact, true, that their message is true, that the God who did this miracle 
is the true God, the God of creation. Now, there's a reason why they didn't already know that. Paul goes on to explain in verse 16, in the generations gone by, He permitted all the nations to go their own way. Basically, He permitted you to go in their own way, your own way. After the fall, God allowed the world to basically follow their own hearts, to remain in darkness, to remain in ignorance, even though He always kept a lamp burning. Okay? He first, of course, lit it with Adam and Eve, and then through the line of Seth, and then you know, their, their whole line all the way through Noah, and then Shem to Abraham, and I think we're more familiar with that. But Abraham is in the line from Adam, we all are, but from Shem and from all these other descendants. And then, of course, Isaac and Jacob and the children of Israel. The Lord kept the light going during all those years. For a while, it may have been in other places, but eventually it was exclusively there. And that's the reason why they were in in ignorance. They didn't have the Scriptures. They didn't have this truth that God had revealed to His people. But even though they did not know Him in that way, Paul goes on to say that He still made Himself known. They weren't without, you know, absolutely without light. In verse 17, He did not leave Himself without witness in that He did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. You didn't have the Scriptures. That was, you know, purely for Israel. But you did have natural revelation. You did see God's power, His invisible attributes. You saw His, His wisdom in, in creation. But here's something else that, that He showed you, and that is His goodness. He's good. He gave you rain. He gave you fruitful seasons. He satisfied your heart. You know, here's another way that God proves His existence to the world, and that is through His goodness. Jesus reminds us in the Sermon on the Mount, He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends His rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So this is God's testimony to mankind where the gospel has not yet reached, that He is and something of what He is like, okay? Not just His invisible, as it were, metaphysical attributes that uh, of, you know, omniscience uh, and, uh, you know, the... um, omnipresence and His almighty power and infinity and so forth, but even the fact that God is good to His creation. So I want you to notice Paul appealing to natural revelation in order to bring his message home. But here's something else to notice. Even with this effort and this argumentation, they could hardly restrain the people from wanting to sacrifice to them. They wouldn't let it happen. They just couldn't get them to stop desiring that. And that reminds us of another thing. When we tell people the truth, we can't expect them to change right away, right? Change is not immediate. Change is not easy. It takes time to adopt new ideas. Uh, John Frame once said that, um, you know, the process goes something like this. You You have your position. Somebody confronts you with a new position, it creates some discomfort in your thinking because your position isn't as ironclad as you used to think it was, and the new position may not be quite as strong as you think it is, and there's a struggle that goes on for some time until eventually you adopt the new position if you see its superiority and you reach what he calls cognitive rest. Well, that takes time, and that's why we need to be patient. You know, that's, there was an evangelistic program that Dr. Piper used in his um, church um, that was down in Escondido when I was in seminary years ago. I'm trying to remember the name of it. can't remember what it was offhand, but the principle was you go door to door, tell people who you are, where you're from, what you're doing. Don't try to bait and switch, you know, just tell them the truth up front. And then if... Tell them you're sharing the gospel, or they'd like to hear something about it, and if they say yes, then you give them some information. You begin to educate them, and then you ask if you can come back, and if they say yes, you come back, and usually when that happened, you come back and they would answer the door, but uh, that's, that's the way it goes, but you don't try to inundate them with everything at one time, but it takes time, okay? It takes time for them to understand and to take on these ideas and The Lord usually takes time to work through these ideas to bring people to Himself. So we need to be patient. We need to take time. 
with those that we minister to and know, you know, that, well, we just got to be in it for the long haul. So as we communicate the gospel to others, there's a few things that we need to be ready to do. We need to be ready to demonstrate, to prove that God exists by using various arguments, such as the ones we're learning in the evening. We need to do more than that. We need to prove that the true God exists. Of course, that's what we're trying to do, but we need to understand that in their minds, they may believe in a God and they may say, well, I agree with you. God exists, but it may not be the same God. So you've got to prove the true God exists by pointing to the things, again, in nature that prove that or show what He's like, okay? And most importantly, I wouldn't spend too much time on that second point, but we need to be ready to show them the Bible is His Word. Okay, the way we do that, as we're going to see in this series, is by first of all showing that the God we see in nature is the God that is revealed in the Bible. But secondly, we need to point to the miracles and to the eyewitness accounts of the fact that miracles took place, and especially that miracle of God's raising His Son from the dead. Because the miracles that Jesus did and the miracle of His being raised from the dead prove that He is the Son of God. And as the Son of God, He says the Scripture is God's Word. And then once that is established, we can use the Word of God from that point to demonstrate who God is and to demonstrate, of course, also the gospel. But we need to demonstrate and, or excuse me, communicate the gospel so that we might turn people away ultimately from their idols. I've already told you, you know, that our society, there may be some people in, in our society who believe in the Greek gods. Seems like there's people who believe just about anything. But even if they don't, even if a majority of people don't do that, their ideas of God are perhaps as bad or worse than what the Greeks believe regarding their gods. And we need to remember as well that people may not necessarily, uh, you know, be committing idolatry just by worshiping a false god. They can also be committing it by uh, putting, placing value on things that are really infinitely below God and elevating those things above Him. The gospel is the only way that they're ever going to ultimately turn from these things. That is our ammunition, so to speak. That is what we need to bring to them because that is what the Lord makes powerful to save, makes powerful to turn them from their idolatry, to turn them to the true God who alone is worthy to be worshipped. If we want to honor the Lord, if we want to be true to the calling that He has given to each one of us, we need to be thinking about how we can bring the gospel to them. That is our task, our main task as, as the church. So may the Lord help us to be faithful to this charge and, you know, again, to be strengthened a bit more in our strategy on how we might actually do that. Uh, let, let's bow, shall we, in a, in a moment of prayer.